and listeners, thank you very much for joining us this evening. This evening, of course, um, I'll be your host, Richard Rambaran, uh, for this program. It's a, what is going to be a very interesting program this evening as we discuss the first 100 days assessment of the newly installed still newly installed PVPC administration um, since August 2020. With us this evening, um, we have some gentlemen who are not strangers to political commentary, political involvement. Um, and I'd certainly like to thank them all for joining us. This evening, we have the Deputy Speaker of the National Assembly, the Honourable Mr. Lennox Schumann, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I'm not sure, perhaps I can revert to calling you Lennox um, for the remainder of the programme, if you don't mind. Um, it's just very convenient for us. But welcome to the programme. Um, thank you, of course, for being here. Thank you for gracing us with your presence. Um, I'd also like to welcome and thank Mr. Timothy Jonas, Chairman for UN United Guyana. Um, Timothy, the um, number of conversations we have now had publicly, it's almost as if we talk more publicly than in any other sphere. So um, I certainly look forward to us having a good conversation here uh, this evening. And with us um, for the very first time on, on a panel which I am hosting is the Guyanese critic. Um, his, this is, of course, his moniker. Um, and not his actual name, but we'll stick to him being the critic this evening um, and certainly look forward to him giving his his point of view. Um, and I certainly hope that all of our viewers and listeners are enlightened, edified, um, and certainly lend, um, the speakers are able to lend a perspective and give their uh, assessment of the newly minted People's Progressive Party administration and their first 100 days in office. Of course, this administration and its installation in August 2nd needs no uh, back, backdrop or backstory. Um, all of the gentlemen that you see here were some way or the other involved um, or uh, were covering the stories associated with the five month debacle which we had. And as such, um, the PVPC takes office at a juncture um, that is, of course, watershed in the history of the country. So this evening, gentlemen, I certainly look forward to us having a riveting discussion and thank you so much all for joining us. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My very first question, of course, um, the way that I would like us to proceed with the program this evening, I'm actually going to let us go through this discussion in a very thematic based form. So we're going to touch on different elements of national development and what has been happening. Um, critical, of course, is uh, over the past few months, um, the immediate effect uh, of policies passed by a national budget um, or perhaps the, the position which has been taken by the, the government of Guyana uh, in, for example, foreign policy, etc. The effect of it may not be able to uh, find its way into the economy or into the, the society or into people's lives almost immediately. Of course, there are some measures which will impact. But what is important is that there is policy intent, there are signals that are being sent, and of course much of the discussion this evening will have to premise around these types of, uh, generally, this type of, of, of discussion. Um, so I'll first off start off, start in, in the sphere of policy, um, and let us just have a very brief overview um, of your thoughts, particularly on the first budget. Um, that has been presented, and let's just deal with the economy first of all. So, Lennox, um, of course, we have not discussed uh, with 
with you on this program, your thoughts on the national budget. So I'd, I'd like to hear um, the first 100 days in office, the People's Progressive Party Civic has presented a national budget. Um, it is a national budget which has actually um, absorbed much of the spending for earlier in the year, but it does have a number of measures, etc., inside. And this, of course, characterizes um, the first 100 days in office. So I would want us to go through some measures in the budget um, and just for you to give me your insight as to what you believe the stewardship of the economy has been over these first 100 days. Thank you. <laughs> well, Chris, it's good to see you. Uh, critic, hello, and Tim, likewise. I won't get pedantic right now, so Lennox is fine. And to the viewers and listeners, I'd say a very good night. Uh, I'm really happy to be part of this discussion tonight. I think the 100 days is a very important marker. And I may stray a little bit here and there, but I will try to get to the, the topic at hand. Obviously, if I digress too far, I'm hopeful that someone will bring me back on course because there's just so much that happened. And sometimes it's really difficult to, to keep up and stay focused um, with all of the distractions. I was in the National Assembly for the presentation of the national budget. I would like to think that the country is thankful for what they saw in the national budget, mainly because we went through pretty much all, almost all of 2020 without a national budget. And I said that as part of my budget speech, that we are presenting a national budget in September of 2020 for a year that has already been expended shows how far we have not come as a nation. And the fact that we have spent most of the money presented in that budget, it really speaks to the stewardship of the economy under the APNU AFC administration. And one thing that I found very appalling while sitting in the National Assembly is that APNU in themselves voted against voted against the allocation of $800 million for indigenous peoples development. We are talking about the most marginalized peoples in this country historically and presently. So you've got an, um, an opposition, and I'm gra granted I'm part of an opposition, but my colleagues on this side, at least on the opposition side, voted against that $800 million for indigenous peoples development. It doesn't matter how you try to fluff it, how you try to twist it, or anything. They are the one who are, ones who ask for the vote, and they are the ones who voted against it. And to me, it shows how they would not have addressed Indigenous peoples, or how they would have addressed Indigenous peoples through their entire five years. Um, I like some of the measures in terms of the reduction in, in um, taxes for some components, I would say that is for the average person. The reversal on used tires, I understand the logic behind it. I do not support the environmental impact of it, but I understand that some people in themselves cannot purchase new tires. So at some point, you know, I've got a car that I've paid 500000 for, and I'm going to go and buy tires equivalent to the cost of the car. It does not make sense. My car does not go fast enough to warrant you know, A-grade tires and so on and so forth. So I have to purchase within my cost structure. That's one. The second thing is, you know, the reversal on, on policy, and I guess reversal in law on used cars. I understand the logic behind that. Not every single family can afford to bring in a 2015, 2017, 18, or 2020 vehicle. So what they've essentially done is made Automo automotives, automobiles, more affordable to the average person so that they could pretty much reach or uh, hang their hats where their hands can reach compared to having it outside. And you have to remember that a majority of the APNU ministers and associates, I mean, look at James Bond, not even a member of the executive, but could buy some fancy Range Rover and look at what the executives in themselves bought. Now, we have to be careful on, at least on that note, parliamentarians are permitted an unlimited um, displacement in the vehicles that they buy, unlimited CC. 
uh, they obviously have restrictions in years and use, um, but you can't buy a truck and some other things, right? So the parliamentarians in themselves have been granted a little bit of latitude with, in line with their service. So in terms of those measures that we've seen, the budget measures, I think those are very important for the average person in terms of the relief that is there in the budget. Um, and remember that budget document is really, really thick. I couldn't dissect every single component of it. But I would say the budget pretty much satisfies the government's mandate and their projected mandate from, 20, from September to the end of December. And we are yet to see, that. that's just a stopgap budget. I, what I would like to see is what 2021 holds. And I think this is where uh, Tim and myself and the our third joiner party will have to sit down and look at it as to what we are looking for in the 2021 budget. And remember in preparation for the 2020 budget, we as political parties did not have a lot of time to dissect that budget. Well, but when we got, at least when I got into parliament, I looked through it, you know, a cursory glance, and I don't see it as too bad for a year that is already spent. Thank you for those comments on, on the national budget, Lennox. Um, Critic, I want to come to you to ask you. Um, in Before you ask the question, mm -hmm. I want to ask uh, Lennox, Mr. Schumann, are you speaking as the speaker, uh, deputy speaker of the house or the 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 representative, the member parliament representing the tripartite. Well, when I'm out of out of parliament and when I'm not sitting in the speaker's chair, I speak as only the representative of our um, tripartite agreement. Okay, okay. Because there's a lot, there's a lot in the budget that could have um, could have been might have been able to been done differently but i see you in agreements and everything so i'm i'm, I'm trying to all, all right so out which one of the hats you wear in tonight we'll we'll so lennox represents the knight of course his party um the liberty and justice party so not um when he's out of the national assembly of course he's representing his party um so i i want to ask you um critic from the from an average person's perspective, I mean, you interact with a number of Guyanese persons, right? You interact with a number of persons who um, are in and around every day. Um, of course, you have a number of conversations um, and you, you're, you're privy to what a, um, a magnitude of, of or a number of common um, or average Guyanese would, would, would would feel. Um, what is the feeling on the ground so far of the stewardship of the economy um, and particularly in light of the 2020 budget? Well, Richard, I don't think I would be saying anything that has not reflected literally in the facial expressions of Guyanese. Guyanese for the last two years, you could look at them and you were wondering if they were constipated, how people face look, right? So as much as I do not have all the details about the budget, I know that I would look to um, persons such as Lennox, Lennox to you know, give a better understanding because he's on the ground in, in, in parliament. But I can tell you, um, for the little that information has been disseminated out there, and the rate at which things are being executed, people just feel a relief that things are moving forward. Because after 2018, December the 21st, there was a, there was a darkness over Guyana where nobody knew what was next. So many things happened. Nobody knew what was next. I... Um, you know, can't say that everything is picture perfect with the budget and the economy, but just the main fact that we have gone into a new phase and the government is very responsive and they go out there and they meet the people, um, that alone brings a certain relaxation to the people. Like everybody right now just thinking about the 25,000 cash grant. And I know that in, I, I don't know if that was 
a part of the budget thing or, or don't I help in any way. But that has brought, um, you know, some satisfaction to the citizens that they are now finally getting things from the government after having a government that for five years just took everything from them. So even if it is just um, for the aesthetics, right? The, the budget is there and so much money spending because as you said earlier, a great part of the budget would have been what was already spent, right? So, but people feel things are moving forward. Businessmen are hopeful. People are looking at things and saying, yes, we now have something to do. And it's a short period of time. And people are even now looking forward to what the next budget is going to be like next year. Right. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, there certainly there certainly has been um, a high degree of activity um, by the government. Um, and at least uh, at least that's the way um, that the public relations uh, team is setting it out. Uh, every time you jump on Facebook, um, you're always seeing the activity of the activities of ministers. You are seeing um, what what is is refreshing in terms of proactivity um, and, and, and persons reaching out. Um, I see no less a person than His Excellency the President is, is going to Region 6 um, on an outreach. So that um, that type and that level of activity is certainly something which is which is different um, and brings, of course, with it, as as Kritika said, a fresh um, a fresh ear, if you will. Uh, Timothy, what what are your thoughts? I mean, we have discussed this um, on a program which which dealt with the budget, um, but so far, it, it, moving away from the budget only, the stewardship of the economy and generally how how uh, the engine has been progressing thus far over the past 100 days and what you are seeing um, in terms of the, the, the intent and the direction. Uh -huh. uh, I don't have to tell you, as you know, an economy does well when there's confidence and there has been confidence and the confidence has been generated and perpetuated by the activity in the industry that you're talking about. Every time you turn on the TV and go on Facebook or, or talk to somebody, there's some government minister going on some outreach, having a conversation, shaking hands and standing up to take pictures. And it's easy to disregard that and say it's not important. And the fact is, a politician with a shovel turning over a piece of um, soil to commemorate some land being given away is not important in itself. But that very activity engenders public confidence. And public confidence is roaring. That's a good thing. There, there's been a lot of bustle um, in two areas that I've seen so far. Housing, which has always been important, and infrastructure. Um, you've seen a lot of contracts being handed out, being awarded. Um, and every time a contract is handed out, somebody, you know, there's, there's a great hurrah. So the Ogle Road, the bridge, um, the dam, hydroelectricity, they talk about using natural gas for, for electricity generation. I think that, uh, Mr. Jack, you even said he wants to provide cooking gas for every household, that kind of thing. A lot of bustle. I think that what's more important and what we have to start asking questions about and looking at is where's the money going to come from? You see, traditionally in Ghana, the award of contracts has been where corruption happens. And we have not asked so far, first of all, where's the government's revenue going to come from? Because we know revenue comes from taxation and we know that it's been a hard year for businesses. Um, I rather suspect that the government has been borrowing against the future expectation of oil income. If they have, there's nothing wrong with that. But I think that as a country, we have to start thinking about how we balance in this income and expenditure. And I also think that as a country, once that information is known, once we know where all this money coming from for all of these big projects, 
we also have to start concentrating on the systems that we have for transparency. Right now, although there's been a lot of bustle, there has not been any change in the system. So that what's going on is that you're seeing a great hue and cry against the acts of corruption of the previous regime. You are seeing people accused of wrong dealing, of taking vehicles, of giving away swathes of land, um, of making contracts that, that benefit themselves, of taking you know vehicles at, at rock bottom prices from in, in deals that have conflict of interest. But we need to start examining the system that permits that to happen and try to see if we can not fix that system so that it is no longer possible for people in authority, whether they look like you or they don't look like you, it doesn't matter. It mustn't be possible for the people in authority to have the power, statutory or otherwise, to make those decisions without everyone knowing, without transparency. I think that it's time we start paying attention to the systems. Mr. Jonas, um, of course, fixing a system, revamping an institution, reforming institutions is is one would one would say that it's not a, a process that can occur in the short term or in the near term. Are you seeing intent um, over the past 100 days in that direction? Um, are you seeing that that is something that this administration that has taken the reins for the next five years, um, are you seeing that that is something that may come out of the process given the, the direction that they're going? You know, when Apna were in power and I was advocating for a system of inclusivity so that whoever's in opposition could sit down at the table for decision making. The APNU supporters that I spoke to, very smug and confident in their power, would say, yeah, that sounds good, but we can't negotiate with those crooks over there who got how many fraud charges and who got how much prosecution charges and that kind of thing. So they would smugly say, yes, it's a nice concept, but we refuse to negotiate with those people because they're crooks. And now I'm saying the same thing. Listen, you have to have a transparent system where those people you don't like are there seeing how you make the decisions. And the new people in power are saying, that's a nice concept, but we're not talking to those crooks over there who rig elections and lie to the people and are bullies. So already you see, I'm afraid, that the smug enjoyment of power gives you that luxury of saying, we are talking to them people, we, we are exercising the power. That's something that's dangerous. You see, I want to be the first to say, and I want to be clear on it. The individuals who are now in power, when I speak to them and when I see their activity and when we see what's going on, they are doing a good job. They are trying their best to get things done. And I think there's a recognition in the PPP that this margin of vote is not a wide margin anymore. They got to try and do the job good so that they can maintain voter confidence. And more than that, there are good people running some of these ministries. Not all, but there are some good people there. And you can see they're doing the best that they can. However, what that puts us in is it puts us in a situation where we prosper, assuming the leadership remains good, by grace. We prosper because we may have people who are making decisions, who are making good decisions. But that's not that's not good enough, because if those people are replaced by corrupt people, or if those people delegate functions to lesser mortals who are corrupt, the system, if it is opaque, if it's not transparent, will permit those lesser mortals or the corrupt people who replace them. The system will enable them to continue to make corrupt decisions. Look, we just talked about the folks, um, critic just, just talked about the allegations made against James Bond. Do we satisfy ourselves by saying, well, we now got a new government, so they're going to prosecute James Bond. They might, he might be guilty or he might not, we don't know, but somebody else is there now. 
in the knowledge that exactly the same system will allow his replacement to make exactly the same decisions without transparency. And remembering that five years ago, there were huge allegations of corruption because the system was the same. Isn't it time that we say, man, let's fix this system. Let's have it transparent. Let everybody be there and see how things are done. I want to pick up on Tim's comment there. Lennox, I was going and to ask I quite, you, do you agree I quite, I quite agree, with what I agree with. I quite agree with what Tim was saying about the system, right? And it is one thing that I said that we have not seen a modernization plan. We have not seen a digitization plan. And the reason we have not seen that plan and we may not be able to see that plan is because when you start to digitize everything, what happens is that you don't have to go and tumble through volumes upon volumes of paperwork and hunt signatures down. All of those things can be found in real time, so you'd be able to catch the crooks right away. And I want to suspect that we have not seen a plan um, for modernization because there are a lot of things that could happen until we get to that point. Look, I spoke about um, parliamentary reform, that we have not seen anything within the 100 days that says we intend on undertaking, not parliamentary, sorry, constitutional reform at such and such time. And the reason for that is that some of these things are some fantastic things that they're going to roll out on the fourth year of their tenure to say because of these things and what we are committing to is going into the next elections with these things. So essentially the politics in itself is actually holding the system back. And for us, take national um, like tendering of contracts and stuff. Why should I have to go and see a minister to understand if I could, you know, put in a bid for a contract. It shows that the system is flat. Basically, we're, we still continue to exist as a banana republic. And once we continue to exist as a, as a banana republic, we are not going to see the political change. Tim raised a very salient point in terms of the issue of non-engagement. Basically, the two political parties are locked in a battle of racing to the bottom. I'm not going to talk to those guys because they're crooks. I'm not going to talk to those guys because they're, they're um, rigors. And then they're going to turn around and say, I'm not going to talk to those guys now because they, we are in power. And the next guy is going to say, well, I'm not talking to them because they're illegitimate. Whatever it is, we're not fostering dialogue and we're not looking at a way to effectively build the structures and systems that the country so deserves. And if we continue to... to what I'd say tolerate the position of non-engagement, then we are doing a disservice to all of the people who vote who voted for all of us. The people didn't vote for me, me because, or any of the political parties, because they want for us to just fail. They want for Guyana to be to be progressive. They want for Guyana to move forward, and they voted for every single political parties because they thought that those political parties have we are to sit down and engage in dialogue on how we could bring about change. You're getting input from all of Guyana on how we could move forward. And if that is the position, why should I take a position of non-engagement? I quite support what, what Tim said. So, so Lennox, you are supporting what Timothy has said. Um, and I have a question which I'd like to point uh, specifically to you, to, to you two. Had you been in uh, Dr. Ali's position, His Excellency the President, in his exact position, President of, of, of the Cooperative Republic um, and, and um, the, the presidential candidate then of the People's Progressive Party who went through um, this, this number of months, etc., and you were in his position right now, what would you have done to engender or to include exactly what you are now advocating for? What you, would you have done different within the first 100 days? Uh, Lennox, you can take it for us as you're on the floor. Chris, Chris but, but here's, here's the thing, right? If you and I um, are adversaries and we continue to turn our backs on each other, how does that help either of us? How does that help the people that we represent? 
at some point we have to come face to face. At some point there must be a hand. Someone must be the bigger person and extend the hand and say, look, you represent a significant component of society. I represent a significant component of society. Can we sit down and have dialogue that does not look at the politics of Guyana, but look at the people? I've said it before, and the Dalai Lama, His Holiness the Dalai Lama said it. Politics and religion are pure institutions. It is people that corrupt them. Now, if we go from it, go at politics, looking out for the people's interests first instead of the political interests, then what do you think we're going to achieve? We are not into politics to see how we could stay in power and get more power and get more power and get more power. We're not about that. We are about addressing the issues, the fundamental and long-term issues for the people. And once that is my primary driver, that is my primary concern, then does it not make sense for me to get as many people on board, even if they don't agree or even if they don't like me? I think sometimes those are the best people that we have to have so that they provide that check, that, that voice of reason at times. And it would only make sense that I extend a hand to the people in themselves that don't like me because those people represent a significant component of society. Right. So um, one, you, you, of course, in, in, in your statement mentioned one, um, engendering dialogue. Um, is there any other thing that you, you, you perhaps would have done? Anything that you would have changed, tweaked? Um, any specific thing to foster? Everything starts with dialogue. Every single thing. I'm, I'm a consummate... I think what I would have changed is sat down with the what I'd say the, the outgoing administration, the opposition and no opposition, and hammer out some of the things that we thought were useful, that would have been effective, that they would have done. If you look at governance and how we've approached it, basically we don't govern in Guyana. There is there's an absence of governance. Governance means that we build systems, right? We develop a system so that every single person, regardless of who they are, can intercept that system at one point and then move from there, right? That is why it's called a system. But basically what happens is one administration comes in and then they take everything that that previous administration did and throw it out the window. And then the next one comes in with their idea and then they throw it out the window. Basically, we do not have Street to go. This political party comes in, they put forward their goal. The next one comes in, they put forward their goal. And all they're doing is swapping goals. I want to see. When I say we, all political parties, which represents all the people, where we then you are going to see that inclusivity at some point. You are going to see buy-in. Of course, we're going to have some minor conflicts here and there. But if you're looking at it from a people-centric position, then I don't think you're going to go wrong. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, Richard, I really like your question because it's all well and good to sit down in our armchairs and talk academically about um, engagement and, you know, embracing and singing kumbaya and let's all live together as one people and you ask the question as a hard question how do you do it and i'd like to answer your question when abraham lincoln ran for president back in the late 1850s going into 1860 and he won his main critic the person who opposed him on the other side he invited that person to act as his Secretary of State. So he took his political enemy, who was a man of proven ability, proven integrity, but his opponent, and he made him Secretary of State. And by doing that, he earned for himself a very competent administrator. And he also managed to bring in someone 
whose interests would be represented within the administration. Now, there are areas in Guyana where everybody agrees. There's not a Guyanese who will tell you that they disagree with our foreign affairs policy in terms of Venezuela, Suriname, um, how we're dealing with the international court. The first thing I would do is I would invite Carl Greenwich to be Minister of Foreign Affairs in my, in my administration. There's not a Guyanese that will not agree that the public service needs to be rebalanced because it's all weighted on one side. It needs to be professionalized. Salaries need to be increased, but it also needs to be balanced. I would invite a proven PPP long-standing supporter, long-standing leader to be ministry with responsibility for home affairs and the public service. Bring in an Andola. So those two ministers, one from APNU, one from the PPP, would also form the cabinet. So they would have the right to sit in cabinet discussions. The vote isn't going to win anything, but that transparency will mean that they have a say and they have input in decisions. The next thing I would do, and we've seen this happen, over the last hundred years, we have seen the head of central housing get fired. And then we've seen a board put in. And then the government, I'm sorry, I gave you the wrong sequence, head fired, a new head put in, and then the board appointed. So the new head has been put in by the government, just like the previous government appointed whoever they wanted as the head and was then fired. We have seen in the energy agency, the head has been fired, a new head put in by the government, and then the board appointed. I wouldn't do that. I would invite the opposition to put two members of that they select on the board. I would put two members, and I would invite Lennox to choose a fifth member. So the board has five. And then I would invite those five people to select a head. When they select the head, I promise you that head will be somebody who is selected on merit. And you know what? If the government changes in five years, that person that they select will not be at risk because that same board that's got Lennox and two of my appointees and two of the other's appointees, that same board will be supporting that same person so that we will have continuity of our policies in those agencies the EPA, Energy Agency, Central Housing. We had to stop the whole Payara project because the PPP had been completely ostracized while APNU was negotiating that project. So we had our largest foreign investor hanging on by a thread because we had to stop the whole thing just so that the new government could get a climatized see what was going on. If my system had been implemented so that APNU had said to PPP, you are invited to put two people on that petroleum commission. I am putting two, and Lennox can put one. When the government changed, the new government would already, by virtue of the fact that it had two people in the commission, it would already be au fait with the Payara arrangement. It would already have supported it, voted for it, or if it voted against being in the minority and still be in the minority. So the project would continue seamlessly. Amelia Falls, every single project that has come up that you think about, that one government unilaterally puts in, in a five-year cycle, if the government changes, the whole economy is topsy-turvy and upside down because the government acts like a dictator. And if the government changes, a new dictator comes and changes everything. So our last set of people throughout Gai Supo, now suddenly the new set of people have put it back in. They have put a CEO of Gai Supo. Let me ask you, Richard. That CEO, who we know is not appointed by the board, who is a competent man, if the government changes in five years, what happens to his job? Do you think he keeps it? What happens to Guy Suko? Do you think it continues to run? So we have sequential dictators because that is our system and that so, has so, to change. So Timothy, let me ask you, uh, let me just tease out the point a little bit more. If the, if, if, if a, if a position of non-cooperation is taken by the opposition in that regard, let's, let's, 
map into your world that you're talking about here. If a, if, if a, a position or a stance of non-cooperation is taken, what do you do in that case? Because we are still leaving it up to, um, you know, the, the perhaps the, the individual um, goodwill, etc. What well, would you do? Two things, Richard. Um, you're saying a big if, because let me tell you, if the APNU supporters learn that President Ali has said to APNU that on that color board, chronicle board. He is putting two people and Lennox is there and they are invited to put two people so that he no longer has control because the swing vote is Lennox, although Apnu might vote with him and Apnu refused to put two people. Apnu supporters will turn on them, will ask them if they had good. Because if Apnu supporters know that their party has that much negotiation power on not just one board, but on all of those boards and not making use of it. They will find it hard to criticize President Ali when using the three people left on the board, his two appointees and Lennox, they start making decisions because every decision they make, all that President Ali has to say to the, his worst enemy, the people who he can do no right by them. All you got to do is say to them, I have invited your leaders to put two people on this board and nobody has turned up. The invitation is an open invitation. They may still come and put two people on the board. And if they do so, Lennox may vote with them and my appoint and this appointee that you say is my appointee might not be appointed. That's all he has to do. And his worst detractors will come to respect him to say, yes, our leaders are not serving us properly. It would be impossible for the opposition to reject. Thank you, Timothy. I think we might have to en en um, engage that further in a conversation, perhaps on shared governance or such the like. Um, let me just pivot the discussion a bit here. Um, we have, of course, discussed uh, the economy and in, in, in including elements of political economy in it. But I want to ask, um, you know, COVID pandemic, it's a very serious matter um, and it has been gripping the nation tremendously. Uh, one of the one of the the quagmires that the the then AP and UFC administration found itself in is that it was absent a parliament um, and could not give the proper fiscal stimulus or fiscal response um, to the the pandemic in terms of tran cash for transfers um, in terms of properly responding um, buying the requisite equipment, perhaps going for supplemental budget, emergency funding, etc. That, of course, is due to the absence of parliament. So uh, perhaps we can we, we can um, ask Lennox then over to Critic and then back to Timothy. Um, what do you think has been the PVP's? Um, how do you rate it, the management of COVID over the past 100 days? Uh, Lennox? Well, uh, I'm sorry that you pivot the conversation uh, away because I think Tim raised, <laughs> raised a very interesting point um, when he spoke about boards. Uh, you see, I, and I, w I want to touch on that before we move on to the COVID, manage COVID management because my community right now is on lockdown and I will get to that. But there is something when we talk about the 100 days, for example, I was looking forward to seeing how the government would divest chronicle or maybe focus it and pivot it away from from government control but what we have seen is when ppp was in there prior to enter 15 apno accused them of using state media and tax dollars for campaign purposes and propaganda then apno got in and PP, ppp started to complain now ppp is back in office and it's simply this this flip-flop and what they have done is that they have actually um dug in even deeper because now they have a minister of communication in uh, Kwame McCoy. So what they have made no effort and they have provided their position that they have no intent of divesting uh, GNNL and Chronicle and all that stuff. They want to control state media uh, and for obvious reasons. Now, when you look at the COVID response and you look at what control and all these things, there is still a massive 
um, I wouldn't say as much as APNU, but there's still a politicization of the COVID relief measures. Remember this COVID relief, it's not from the Bank of Ghana, it's not from taxpayers, it's provided by the American government, and there's some funding from the World Bank to provide COVID relief to the people. But there are communities, my community, for example, is on lockdown right now. And what they did is provided hampers. They had a team go in there with uh, Minister Pauline Sukai. I asked if I could be part of that team, and I was snubbed by the minister. So they went in there, and the only reason why they are not going into these communities in Region 4 to provide that $25,000, it is because there isn't a minister that is available to go and take a nice picture ministers are doing um, in various parts of the country. But the minute they get a minister available to go and take a picture and say, look, relief, then those people are going to continue to struggle. So while that is happening in terms of the COVID relief, I want to say that I'm happy to know that they have a designated um, institution for people who are COVID positive granted at a tremendous cost to taxpayers, which is the one point something billion dollars Ocean View, um, I, I almost said hotel, hospital. Um, and I want to say that they've done a tremendous amount of work in getting that done. My sister-in-law is currently in that institution. I have asked if there is anything that I could bring for her to support her while she's in there, because I know sometimes the food at the hospital is not good and so on and so forth. They said, Mr. Schumann, all the patients that come in here are well taken care of. We provide everything that they need, dietary and otherwise. So there's no need to bring anything. I'm happy to hear that. So I think in that regard, the management of the illness at that level is good. What I don't give the government good marks for is the lack of support for communities such as mine. Right now, we have a support group that is trying to find donations and all of these things for a community, an indigenous community, that was depressed under the APNU administration. Unemployment is high. We don't have any kind of resources, like natural resources in the community. So we are trying to find the, the kind of support for that community. And I have not heard of the measures that the government intends on taking to bringing relief to the people in there. They took in some hampers last week that they said, all right, well, we bring hampers for every single person. But that, those hampers would only last about four days. The community is on lockdown for two weeks minimum, and the people don't have any kind of an income. So essentially what you're doing is pretty much putting people in an environment, remember you're not permitted to leave your house and all of these things, without the necessary support for them. And I don't think that I could give the government good marks for that. There is also the... Have a very, they have a very convoluted system. And I don't want to berate Minister Edgehill too much because I know that up until Mr. Ashney Singh was assigned the portfolio of um, finance minister, he pretty much had his plate filled. But he did ask me for uh, at least a status update on our COVID protocol at the airport, which I could not provide because I did not see one make it to my desk to see what our port of entry, which is the airport, uh, what our COVID protocols are. And my understanding right now is that it is a very convoluted system. I know that there are people who would have applied to have a COVID screening point in the US and also in Ghana that will provide you um, your COVID result with a PCR test in two hours. I don't know the status of that. I don't know if it is operational. I don't know what the government's position is on that in repatriating or um, I'd say people who want to leave Guyana or, or anything of the sort, uh, whether it's employees or just Guyanese wanting to come home. So in terms of that, I don't think that I could give the government good marks on that. Um, but once again, at the institutional level, at the GPHC and how they manage that compared to Apple. Okay, thank you. Um, Lennox, at certain points, your your audio is freezing, the audio and video. So I'm I'm not sure if maybe we can we can try to sort that out um, somehow. Critic. Uh, 
I'm I am not I'm not hearing you. Um, Before I go into what you're asking about COVID and the pandemic, I want to go back a little and um and just to bring clarity because when people uh view any program that I on is to get it in the layman terms that the regular man can understand. That is why you know my viewership is number one in the Caribbean. Um now, Timothy was talking about the different boards and putting people there and, and um, Lennox echoed the same sentiments about this pull and tug in terms of politics. But you know, when you have to pick, if you're going to put on boards, people similar to the likeness of um, Ganesh Maipal, Christopher Jones, Sherrod Duncan, um, you know, uh, Leonard Craig, Karen Cummins, former minister. If, 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 if this is the pool you got picked from, I am asking myself how anything can work. Uh, just to be fair, right? So the, the, the administration, and it is needed, I am not disagreeing that we need to reach across the table and work. And I'm not disagreeing the fact that, yes, we got this, well, who bad and who rig election and this and that. But those are matters of fact that exist. And the reason those people are out of government is because the majority chose that. Democracy rules and decided and listen to me, we want to see the back of those people. Unfortunately, you can't see the back of them. They've just gone on to another side that creates or continues to create imbalance in our society. So is it the onus of the administration, the ruling administration to reach out or the failed administration to start changing its modus operandi. Because again, they had a new administration coming and within days they should have been acting differently and reaching out. But reach out to who? An opposition leader who went to region five and created confusion and, and, and continue to sow discourse in our society and try to create Racial division, how do you do that, right? Then Lennox, I want to ask, you are a part of the opposition. Have you reached out as an individual? Because you have been reached out to as opposition by the government. Have you, who is now holding by one hand, having, having um, placed in a position, obviously by the leading at the, the administration, you hold an eye by one. Have you reached out to harm to the opposition and said, man, look at look at me. Look at how I am being treated by this administration. And this is a result of me. You're sitting here and you're talking about dissatisfaction with the administration. You're afforded that opportunity while this administration placed you as deputy speaker for the house. So obviously there is some understanding there. This administration has reached out to a part of the opposition, have you reached out to them and said, man, listen to me, this is how it can work. Look at me. I have the opportunity to speak. Um, I have the opportunity to represent my people. And I still have the opportunity or have been given the opportunity by the administration to play a role and play a part. So, you know, it's, it's all nice and dandy with the pull and talk that exists. It's fair. But we got to go back and ask ourselves, how do we deal with this? Do we go forward and say, here, a lot of mistakes have been made, and let's throw out one more olive branch and see what's going on. It is fair. It is fair to say, listen to me, let's put um, some members, board members on, on boards, and let's let things happen. But when you see, what individuals are willing to do to get into power? Who you put in the board? Christopher Jones and Sharon Duncan? There's that board is over board. Well, pretty, <laughs> let's, let's, let's try to um let's try not to to, to be attacking people personally. I understand the point you're making. There's no personal attacks here. We, we, 
Right. Well, let's let's try not to go into the totally and go on with people, right? I mean, everybody who is looking at the program and following Guyanese politics would understand if you make reference to a grouping, etc. But let's try not to let's let's stick on on some of the issues that we talk about. The the matter of good faith and good faith negotiations and and that element of trust being there, we've established its importance. Um, and of course, like I like I mentioned, we will have to um. You know, delve fully into this. I think we can perhaps ask for a space on the on the show um, to deal with this matter specifically. How do we move forward with this conversation of shared governance? What forms do we explore? Is it something that is even worthwhile exploring in the current political landscape and the absence of trust, etc.? But I do take your point. Um, I there there are elements there that I've heard members on this panel express in various forms, um, and then of course elements which they would be the persons might disagree with. Um, on, on a matter of, of COVID though, um, I know that you were one of the persons who was there um, on the scene uh, live and direct when, the, when when there was the first COVID case, when they would have kept um, the funeral, it's et cetera, in, 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 right, from patient zero in good hope and what's not. Um, and then you would have seen, of course, being on the ground and, and, and being all around um, how the, the actual reaction is in society, etc. Um, what what are your thoughts so far on how the, the on how things have been progressing, as well as um, you know the measures that have been put in place? What what the management of COVID thus far over the past um, 100 days? I can't say it is the best plan that is implemented or has been implemented. And I say that being fully well aware, and we all know we are in a pandemic. The reference to the pandemic is because it says it's the world over. And what is funny is first world nations who really and truly have no hurdles similar to those that we have to overcome to deal with certain issues. We already would have had a, a, a taxed healthcare system. Um, you know, America is grappling with the pandemic. And if you look at what we have been doing, if you look at the numbers, if you look at the statistics and compare it to what's been going on across the world, I think we have <laughs> done, or the administrations have done fairly well. And I must say the administrations, I'm not gonna separate. Um, the APNO AFC administration did fairly well um, when the, the pandemic came on. When the PPP administration came in, they started doing more testing, which show up more um, persons with the COVID. Has it been the best plan? I can't say. Only when this is over, I, I don't think any of us can say. Because firstly, you're dealing with something to the likeness that no Guyanese medical professional has ever encountered. No Guyanese has ever encountered in their whole life. Um, I presently am um, working along with the Ministry of Health to highlight, sensitize, and educate the people. Highlight the issues, the COVID issues, and sensitize and educate the people. Um, because the government has taken a position, I'm not talking for the government, this is a matter of fact, we see they're opening up back the economy. They're trying to balance it out. How that is going to affect our society, we will only know within the next 30 days. But nothing drastic has happened in terms of the rise in COVID. It's been consistent. I do not see it um, reaching a, a flattening curve as yet, where it will be on the decrease after that. Not being a, 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 a medical professional myself, I can't that go in to what I think they should have done better. But what I'm seeing and making comparisons to what's going on across the world, 
I think we in Guyana have dealt with it fairly. Consecutive administrations. Timothy, do you agree with that? We did the best we could. I think we remember it, it was a learning curve. When COVID started, no one knew what it, was, what it was about. And then we learned some things about it. We learned that it doesn't do well in hot climates. Um, we learned that it likes closed spaces. No, we're lucky. We live in the tropics, sun beating us. Um, we have the luxury of space in Guyana. We, we're not crowded like London or New York or, you know, um, the large cities. So we have a level of protection that nature has provided. As critics said, we also took steps, both administrations, that were useful. Now, you can't stay in lockdown forever. You have to open up the economy. And I think this government realized that. But by the time the government started that process, which I, I think needed to be done, we were already acclimatized to wearing masks. We were already educated to social distancing. We had already set up virtual platforms for meetings, um, ways to social distance and still carry on business. As, as you know, most students are learning from home and that kind of thing. So the economy is opening up, but it's opening up in a different way, in a way that shows respect for COVID. There are a number of difficulties we have. The first we've dealt with, what um, Lennox is talking about, travel. Our two ports of entry, Temeri and, and um, Ogle, have very strict guidelines as to who can come in. So in order to come in within, um, I, th I think it's 48 hours before your flight, you have to show that you took a test and you came up negative for COVID. On the flight, you are masked. And when you get in, depending on how long before you were tested negative, you either have to self-isolate um, or you have to take different measures. So that safeguard, that barrier wall is up. We're not allowing it to be broken down. The rest of the world, especially up north, and we, we tend to look northward when we're looking abroad, they are getting into winter and they are seeing serious spikes because the COVID bug does well in cold, damp conditions. So they are going to have a spike. We're having a spike, but not as bad as what you see in, in France and England and the States. I think Texas reached one million um, today, positive cases. That is something. One of the good things that this administration has done is, is that it has increased testing. And that was important. It allowed us to see Lenox's community and very quickly see the damage that is being done there. The drawback that they have is that our borders with Venezuela and Brazil are porous and the lifestyle of the people in the interior is not conducive to social distancing. You cannot have them wearing masks and, and practicing social distancing in the interior. It doesn't work. And when they interface with Brazil, interface with Venezuela, those porous borders make them particularly vulnerable, which is why you see the disproportionately high figures in Region 1 um, going down to 8. So we have to think about that. And the one shortcoming I will identify is what Lennox talked about. The solution cannot be a lockdown in a village that is already borderline poor and does not have a margin of fat to look after itself. That can be the solution. I think more has, I congratulate the government on their testing to keep abreast and to see what's happening. I also congratulate them on their transparency that we are informed. They haven't kept it secret. And you will remember the previous administration was taking steps not to publish information. But having identified hotspots, I think more needs to be done for the protection of the people. A lockdown is a simplification. It doesn't solve the problem and it exacerbates the problems that they already have. But overall, I think a lot of good has been done. There are a few areas that need some improvement. So I'll just I'll just ask a very simple thing um, before we go to uh, the break, which the moder which the um, the technical personnel is indicating to me that we have to go on as soon as, as, as I'm done with this. For Lennox, critic, as well as Timothy, just one very simple thing. If you are to rate the response to COVID 
by the PVP administration over the past 100 days. With grading A to F, what would you give it? And we can start with Lennox. Talk about being put on the spot right away, Richard. <laughs> Look, I, I agree with Tim. We have to commend the government for their efforts and how far they've gotten. Um, the One of the issues that I have is pretty much the social structure in indigenous communities does not support lockdown. We have a different social environment compared to Georgetowners or, or Coastlanders. So I don't really support that component. But if I were to rate the government's response from A to F, A being the pass and F being obviously the fail, I I would more likely give them a, a C or a C plus uh, because I have not seen the support measures in place for indigenous communities yet. Thank you. Kritik? I'll give the government a B plus. Uh, like, I would want to think any teacher would give a child who is learning a new, a new curriculum. Thank you. Timothy? I think they get a good B. I agree with Lennox. The one shortcoming that I've seen is the oversimplification of the remedy in the interior regions. That needs more work. But except for that, in terms of educating people, um, keeping the numbers as low as possible, it's worked. Our most populous area, Region 4, the numbers are remarkably low. It's in those regions that you do not control the borders, and the government can't control the borders, that, that you have um, spikes. But they need a better system of caring for the ill who are there. Thank you. Uh, technical folks, we can go for the break now. Travelspan is pleased to announce that the airport in Guyana is now open. There are flights from New York and Miami non-stop to Guyana. Call Travelspan for all your travel needs to Guyana or for your vacation to Mexico or Punta Cana. Call 718-845-0437. That's 718-845-0437. Flights are now on sale to Guyana and vacation packages are now on sale to Mexico and Punta Cana. Call 718-845-0437. Logistics International, based in Trinidad, with representatives in Guyana, is pleased to announce its shipping services from Trinidad to Guyana. Logistics provides shipping services and has experienced personnel to handle all of your shipping needs from Trinidad to Guyana. Buy in Trinidad and let Logistics handle all of your shipping to Guyana, from small boxes to container sizes. Call Logistics in Trinidad at 1-866-336-8218 to handle all of your shipping needs and they handle all sizes. Logistics International has been shipping for over 22 years to many Caribbean countries with reliability and dependability. Call 1-868-336-8218 in Trinidad. That's 1-868-336-8218 or email at licl_cargo at gmail.com. Globespan 24-7 continues its efforts to serve the communities. The platform provides for all sides to air their views and discuss solutions. Viewers in Guyana and across the world are participating in these discussions. Globespan's platform offers Guyanese an opportunity to express their concerns and discuss solutions in the political realm, thereby addressing the polarized situation. Discussions also include social ills, such as alcoholism, domestic violence, and suicides, that have been plaguing the people. The Globespan 24-7 platform connects the diaspora and the world with Guyana. So become a supporter of Globespan 24-7 today by clicking the badge icon on the lower right side of your screen. For only $10 a month, you will be a supporter of Globespan 24-7 initiative and have a badge displayed on your Facebook profile. Help us to continue to serve the communities. Cannot travel due to COVID? Then treat yourself or your loved one with a gift. Purchase it online, then let Travelspan Shop and Ship take care of the rest. Travelspan is now offering a Shop and Ship program to Guyana and Trinidad. Cheap rates plus tracking and multiple offices in Georgetown, West Coast Demerara, and Berbice to take care of your package. 
Treat yourself and ship your Christmas gifts early this year. In Guyana, 227-1701. And in New York, call 347-238-2201. That's 227-1701. And in New York, 347-238-2201. Let Travelspan and Globespan take care of your online shopping and shipping. Thank you. Uh, welcome back, viewers and listeners, to our program this evening. This evening, we are moving through a discussion that we are having here on the first 100 days of the PPPC's administration, um, the newly installed People's Progressive Party administration. Of course, um, we have with us here Mr. Jonas, the Guyanese critic, um, as well as Lennox Schumann. So, um, we, we're coming off of the heels of a discussion there on healthcare and the management of COVID. <coughs> now, we um, we have gone through a gamut of issues, including matters related to governance, including matters related to the economy, the budget, um, as well as healthcare. But I just want to ask um, to our panelists because I want to get their their organic views here. What do you think? Um, and this question goes to um, Critic firstly, um, and then we'll go over to Lennox, and then we'll go um, to Timothy. What do you think has been over the past 100 days a major misstep by the government as one? And secondly, what would you have done different over the 100 days? So Critic, you first of all, what, what do you think has been a major misstep and then what would you have done differently? Just one thing. Um, firstly, one must take into consideration as much as the government would have stepped in for just over 100 days now, um, the budget has only existed for over 50 days. So when the government had the full ability to do things and really hit the ground running is only 50 days now. Um, not being a politician, I have to make a comparison. And that comparison comes from the previous administration um, 100 days. And if you make a comparative analysis of this administration um, under the COVID-19 constraints, only 50 days having a budget uh, just coming out of a country that was devastated uh, by political turmoil for almost two years. And you do a comparative analysis of an administration that came in, came in in 2015 with overwhelming support from all walks of Guyana. I could tell you, if you do an analysis based on that, a comparative analysis, there was no misstep um, so far or nothing that could be considered a major misstep. Everybody makes mistakes, but there wouldn't have been any major misstep if we we're going to do, because what is the benchmark? The benchmark has to be the 100 days of the last administration, because how do we know what is a major mistake? if we do not have something to pit it against. And if you look at an administration, the two, the, the, two um, the different administration, the different circumstances that they came in under, you can't list a major, uh, any major missteps. I have not been able to clearly see any major missteps by this administration. And what was your next question? The second question? The other question is, what would you have done differently over the 100 days? Or what's something that you would have brought differently to the table um, over the 100 days? I, I would say I would go with what Timothy and um, Lennox are fighting for. I would, would have really bent backward to reach out to the opposition because the only real problem that we have in this country. We have the resources, we have everything. We have two major problems. Is um, 
two political parties that are two sides of a coin that is being spun by a gambler and um well that's, that's, that's one way to put it and this 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 our difference is so if somebody was to lean really lean backward the, the, this creates the confusion in this country's politics and corruption yes corruption is what, what was in my mind this corruption by the way is shared by both sides of the political divide right so if if an uh, administration that came in really leaned backwards, right? And this is from my perspective. They lean backward, really lean backward to, to involve the opposition. I think we could have started looking at heading in a direction where Guyana could really be seeing change. But again, I am not, I've never been a PPP member or a PNC member, and I don't come with the extensive background that these people have of each other that really fosters this hatred and everything else that they have for one another. But if I were afforded the opportunity, I would really lean backwards to get the opposition on board. Because if you look at of recent, even Region 5 and so, it could be blamed on a side. It could be blamed on politics. It could be blamed on our racial divide. So you really have to get a, a government coming in with a, a, I would have expected a political will to see this 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 fostering or bridging this divide we have, I this this all that is actually needed for moving forward in Guyana. Thank you for that, Chris. Chris I, I guess I guess you want me to get in here, right? Yeah, yeah. Then one, one of one of one of the missteps, or I I could think of two really. The first one is I don't think that they have pursued some of the alleged wrongdoings of Apnoid. And I'm not, I'm not talking about witch hunting. I'm talking about ensuring that there is a proper, or there, if the government, if, correction, if the opposition and the people don't have the confidence in the police force under the PPP's administration, that they could reach out to the international community and ask for investigators, forensic auditors, and so on, to come into the country and maybe go through the books and look at what the alleged crimes are and pursue that um, to its uh, logical and legal end. I have not seen the government take that position, which disappoints me quite um, quite a lot. So I really wish that they would have gone that direction to remove the political tinge that tends to, to plague politics, you know, especially a transition. That is something that I, I would definitely have to say that the government has failed to address that. Um, and I was really hoping that they would uh, the, the next misstep is not, um, I'd say, not reaching out to indigenous communities, once again, to provide the kind of relief uh, for those for those communities. I think that is something that uh, I would not give them enough of a grade on. I would, I, I would keep going and going at that because we are seeing the difficulties and the hardship in those communities. Um, reaching out to the opposition, as Critic rightfully put it, I think that is that is a big one. And I don't know if I missed one of your questions in there. Did I? What would I have done different? Yes, what would you have done differently during the period? Now, you take those same, those same three answers and simply address them. And once you address those, I think you would have had a stellar 100 days. Thanks. Timothy? As, as I said, um, I like the COVID management. I like the focus on infrastructural development, housing. A lot, a lot of good has been done. Um, I will say I personally like President Ali. I think he's determined to leave a legacy that is good. He's concerned about his legacy and he wants to do a good job. And I, I think that he's trying his best, even though the people around him um, may not live up to his expectations. Hopefully he can deal with that. I think that the misstep I would point to is the old cyclical ethnic cleansing. Um, Apnu did it in 2015. All the, all the positions, all the government positions were cleansed, all the people were removed, and 
the afternoon party boys and the army folk went in from Georgetown Hospital to Nissel to state media. I mean, it, it was dramatic, it was complete, and it was unforgivable. And what we've seen now is a repeat of the same dozens, if not hundreds, of termination letters going out to people employed in the public service, people employed in the different ministries um, because of their politics, because it may be perceived that they were appointed by the previous regime. So the old ugly cycle starting over again. Um, if you are going to say that you want to be government for all the people, you cannot perpetuate that cyclical cleansing. You have got to demonstrate to everybody so everybody can see that there is a fair system. You are not restoring your cronies, your parties and friends. The most obvious example I can give you is when um, Carl Greenwich was no longer, could no longer sit in parliament, could no longer be a minister because of his citizenship. And Granger created a post for the gentleman in public, in um, foreign affairs, um, secretary, foreign affairs secretary or something, previously didn't exist. So a job given for a crony, all the perks, same car, same privileges. Now that was an abuse of my taxpayer money. And I had fully expected that with the change, that would disappear. That job would, that didn't exist at all and was created to feed and clothe a, a, a crony would be removed, but it wasn't. So that same imaginary job is now held by Robert Passat, another crony. That's not the way to say to the Guyanese people, we are the government for all the people. So as part of the renewed cycle of cleansing that I saw, I also saw the reinstitution of cronies of the old guard coming back in to collect their pound of flesh. Um, I didn't think it was desirable. I think that the government may have lost some goodwill because of it. But I hope in the future to see transparent systems where people are put in on merit, not by grace, not because somebody made a good decision, but because the legislation has changed to make it statutorily mandated that this is the system we follow to hire people. Thank you, Timothy. Um, of course, the the folks in the background are signaling to me um, that I have to begin to wrap up the program. Um, but before before we head to the end of the program um, or on our way to the end of the program, I, I'd want to ask. Um, so we have we have discussed 100 days, but what about the next year? What do you expect from the PPPC administration? Let's say we are to fast forward to 2021. What do you expect? What do you hope? If you were to be giving some advice to them, what would you hope um, to see them achieve by end 2021? Uh, and I'll, of course, start this with Lennox, then we'll go to Critic and then over to Timothy. Well, I think one of the things that I really want to see, uh, as since we're at the end of 2020, what, what would I like to see at the end of 2021? I would like to see some degree of systems being built so that we don't end up with corruption again. If we are going down that path, at least we would find a way to to cut it and or at least take every step that we every possible step that we can to end corruption. So by building that system, we need to see a modernization, at least some some framework for modernization. I'd also like to see some framework for constitutional reform. And obviously, a national infrastructural development plan. As you know, many communities rely on airplanes, indigenous communities, for their supplies. And with uh, COVID present right now, many of those communities are not being supplied by those very airplanes. So we have to ensure that those things are addressed. If you've got a massive infrastructural development network, then you don't have to rely on airplanes. You could drive out and go and get whatever you need and maybe have market access. Um, I would also like to see movement and compliance with the bilateral agreement between the Kingdom of Norway and Guyana, so that we are going to see the, the land titles that the indigenous peoples have been applying for for time immemorial 
be addressed. I think without some of those things, <clears throat> I don't see that 2021 would be would be closing off very nicely for me. And I would tell you also not for our constituents. Um, I could go on. It's a it's a long and comprehensive, but not uh, conclusive nor exclusive list. But I I know we're time sensitive right now as I watch the clock. Yeah. Thank you very much, Lennox. Um, I have one more question, but I'll come back to that. It's one of the very simple ones. Critic. Um, you're on mute. What I would like to see in the next 100 days? No, no. I what would like to see by the end of 2021? Oh, the by the end of 2021? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm hoping that for the first time in the history of Guyana, some politician will go to prison for uh, corrupt acts that have they've been accused of, and many are now being, uh, you know, ahead of the court as a result of their corruption and, and um, what recently happened with the elections. I'm hoping that somebody, um, something that never happened before in this country, somebody we can see in prison. At least they will have a political wing in jail by the end of 2021. Thanks, Chris. Timothy? We got a crisis that needs talking about. And the time for words is over. The time for talk is over. We are going to be underwater unless we fix our drainage system unless we take back the drains from the squatters who have been filling up the drains. When I say squatters, I'm talking sometimes about middle class, wealthy people who fencing off, filling drains, putting the land higher than the road, concreting their yard, um, building without permission. If you concrete your yard, the two inches of rainfall that can be absorbed in disappears. Rain will have to run off that concrete and go somewhere else. If your drain has rubbish in it, or if your drain is beach up, the water will not flow. We've had rain and we've seen the city flood recently with just half a day of rain. Up the East Coast has been flooding. It's time to stop talking about it and it's time for each NDC in each area to get strict. Look at its drainage system, fix the drainage system, take back the drains from the squatters who are there, um, Georgetown, the outflows need to be looked at, the drains need to be sorted. That is something that has to be done urgently or else all the noise we're making, um, we're going to be making it with a snorkel. And I would like to see the government focus on that urgently over the next year because the time for talking about it is over. Definitely. Thank you very much for that, uh, Timothy. So, Folks, we are at the end of our program here this evening, and of course, we have been speaking um, about an around 100 days assessment of the new PVPC administration. Now, to do some amount of justice to the topic at hand, let me just ask um, each of you once again the very simple or not so simple task of giving a rating. Let's go A to F once again and read the 100 days of the PVP in office, starting with Lennox. It seems as though I have this pleasure of leading, <laughs> leading with, with disagreements here. Um, I, I don't know what rating are we, what, what's the rating scale? One to 10, A to Z, uh, doing, is there a different it, rating we're scale? F. We're doing A to F. A to F. In the, in the 100 days, I would simply give the government a B. Um, you know, there are some things, uh, I think crit Critic might have put it very amply, is that, you know, a new child comes back or comes to town, then you need, they need some time to get together with their work. Uh, some minor missteps, but I think they have done a tremendous amount more than I would have seen in the last two years under APNU. So I'd give them a B on that. Thank you. Pratik? 
I would give the administration a B, uh, putting all the circumstances together and, well, again, doing a comparative analysis of the last administration. So a B for me. Thank you, Kriti. Timothy? They get a C, but a good C. I believe that President Ali is a smarter, more proactive, better listener um, than his predecessor. He's a better leader than his predecessor. And he's shown energy and he's shown dynamism that has been good. I have not seen better systems implemented for greater transparency. I have seen some of the old guard come back that nobody wanted to see again. Um, I have not heard a whisper about constitutional reform. And there has been a marked resistance against reaching across to the opposition to try to reduce the winner-take-all stakes so that the fight is not a fight to the death, as we keep seeing. Um, those are my criticisms. And for those failures, I'm afraid I won't do better than a C. But I do want to say it's a good C because there's been a lot of energy, a lot of activity, a lot of investor confidence, and a lot of... Um, a lot of a lot of reaching out within the society. Um, a lot of it has been photo ops, as you yourself said, but I, I don't think you can ignore the good that, that has been done, reopening the economy, dealing with COVID. Um, so a good C. Thank you. Gentlemen, we are sadly to the end of our time this evening. Um, we've had a very, very engaging audience here um, on the Facebook Live. I've been following some of the commentary. Um, when you guys get a chance, you can go and read it. These folks are very, very amped um, about our discussion this evening. But I'd want to thank um, all of our guests here this evening, Mr. Jonas, um, Mr. Critic, Mr. Schumann. I'd want to thank Nohar and the team at Globespan once again for providing us with this platform uh, for a very pertinent discussion on the 100 days assessment. Um, I have, of course, tried my best to uh, engage uh, you folks as much as possible um, to be able to uh, tease out as much of the assessment as is possible in this short period of time. Um, for some reason, these discussions, even when they go on for two hours, two and a half hours, they are left wanting much, much more. Um, but thank you so much, gentlemen. It's already 9.35 here in Guyana. Viewers and listeners, thank you very much. I'd like to thank each of our panelists, um, especially this evening, for spending their, their, their evening with us. And I certainly look forward to us um, having a much more uh, or, or uh, another discussion on many of the issues which we have discussed here this evening. So viewers and listeners, ladies and gentlemen, uh, panelists and team, thank you all very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, Richard. Lennox, critic, good talking to you.